Welcome to the History of Witchcraft. Episode 37. Suffer not a witch to live. The matter came even to the ears of Nero the Caesar, and he gave order to bring Simon the Magian before him. And he, coming in, stood before him, and began suddenly to assume different forms, so that, on a sudden, he became a child, and after, a little old man, and at other times, a young man, for he changed himself in both face and stature into different forms, and was in a frenzy, having the devil as his servant. And Nero, beholding this, supposed him to be truly the Son of God. But the Apostle Peter showed him to be both a liar and a wizard, base and impious and apostate, and in all things opposed to the truth of God, and that nothing yet remained except that his wickedness, being made apparent by the command of God, might be made manifest to them all. An excerpt from the Acts of Peter and Paul. Welcome back to the History of Witchcraft podcast. Last week, we waved goodbye to Matthew Hopkins, John Stern, and early modern England. It's been quite the run, and it's going to be odd to move back to topical episodes rather than narratives. This week, we're considering the Roman Empire as it became a Christian state, abandoning its pagan past and embracing Christ. Think of it as a sequel to episode 19, which was our episode on pagan Rome. While the Roman Empire collapsed into various barbarian states in the 4th and 5th centuries, this was not the end of Roman hegemony over the Mediterranean. New Rome, Constantinople with its enormous Theodosian walls, would remain a significant power for centuries, before declining in the face of Islamic conquest and finally being snuffed out in 1453 as the walls came tumbling down in the face of Mehmed the Conqueror's cannons. The first outwardly Christian Roman Emperor was Constantine the Great, who began the construction of the city that would take his name, as well as having his son and heir, as well as his own wife, murdered, which is substantially less impressive. He and his successors would make Christianity the state religion of the empire, and began persecutions of pagan practices. Despite using the Greek language following Christianity, and not controlling Rome itself for the vast majority of its existence, the empire continued to call itself the Roman Empire. It still had a senate, although in a ceremonial role rather than legislative, and the people themselves saw them as Roman. Despite this, the term Byzantine Empire is often used to differentiate the classical empire from the medieval one, with the term coming from the name of the town that occupied the site of Constantinople prior to the mother of cities being built. Nevertheless, the state that fell in 1453 was a direct and unbroken continuation of the Empire of Caesar. Jointly with the West, the Greek East developed the idea of demons being evil, with the word specifically referring to the servants of Satan rather than its previous use as a name for both angels and demons. To seek assistance from a demon, a being that would never assist a human being due to their hatred of humanity, was at best deluded, and at worst heretical, and so sorcerers were, in effect, demonised. Like we will see with the conversion of the Anglo-Saxons and the Franks to Christianity, the transition from a pagan society to a Christian one required the adaptation of some pagan practices and careful scrutiny was taken to decide which practices were outright demonic, that is, evil tricks of the devil, to sway man into sin, and which were either less harmful and could be tolerated, or were even a force for good. The late professor Valerie Flint suggests that the evil nature of demons could sometimes protect those accused of sorcery and witchcraft from punishment in the early days of the Christian Empire. The demons have had all of time to perfect their ways of seduction and temptation, with the sole aim of lowering mortals. Those that fell should be helped back up, not consigned to damnation, which, after all, was the intended goal of the demons. As the church became stronger, and its place in Roman society unchallenged by other faiths, 
The threat of internal heresy would take pride of place in the pantheon of dangers to the Christian church, and by being wed to heresy, witchcraft would gradually be treated less leniently. Through the long history of the late classical and medieval Roman Empire, the arguments over the nature of witchcraft and astrology would be heatedly debated. This episode will mainly be looking at the period of the Roman Empire after Constantine's conversion, as well as the centuries following, as the empire converted in both religion and culture to become the champion of Christianity. We will also look at the representation of magic in the New Testament, as these depictions would go on to influence church thought on the topic. Now, despite much of this podcast's run being devoted to Christian societies and their belief in witchcraft, we've not yet examined the biblical examples that informed the church's hostile view of magic. In effect, we've been working off the assumption that, of course, the church was opposed to magic, because it always had been and that the growth of the witch panic was an evolution of this policy. With these upcoming episodes, we have a chance to properly consider the opinions of the Church Fathers, and the biblical examples that would provide the framework for the early modern witch hunts. The first and most obvious person that would meet the pagan Roman standards of a magician would be Jesus Christ. The actions that would be considered miracles by his disciples were seen as sorcery by the Roman state. For those unfamiliar, Christ was said to have changed water into wine, fed thousands of people with a handful of food, walked on water, and risen from the dead, among other things. To his disciples and their converts, these were held to be signs of his divinity, a clear demarcation line between holy and unholy acts. To anyone else, he was clearly either a talented charlatan or a sorcerer. Of course, Christ's PR department won out, and he comes across very favourably when compared to another biblical figure, Simon the Magus. In most versions of the New Testament, Simon is a Samaritan priest that can perform some magical acts, but when he meets Philip the Evangelist, he is so impressed by the acts that he can perform that he eagerly converts to Christianity. When he meets St. Peter and St. John, he is absolutely gobsmacked when the people of Samaria receive the Holy Spirit from the touch of the saints, and offers them money in return for this power. The apostles were mm, less than pleased with the offer, declaring that Simon Silver should perish with him for seeking to receive God's power through money. This is the source of the term simony, used by the church to describe the sin of buying positions in the clergy. A more entertaining account of this meeting is found in a 2nd century Greek text called the Acts of Peter, where this encounter is depicted essentially as a magical duel between Simon and Peter. Simon attempts to prove to the people of the city that he is a god by levitating and performing other magical acts, and Peter, incensed by this, prays to God that he stop flying. Lo and behold, the invisible demons that had been aiding Simon are dispelled by the power of God, and Simon falls from a significant height and breaks both of his legs. Clearly, there's a touch of that Old Testament God still kicking around here. Simon is then stoned to death by his former devotees, who have now realised that the true power is with Peter. In another source written after the fact, the Acts of Peter and Paul, this debate is conducted in the presence of Emperor Nero, and again, Simon levitates and again falls after the praying of Peter. The fall causes the magician to be split into four parts, which naturally killed him. The Emperor orders Peter and Paul to be arrested for, you know, killing a man with what appears to have been sorcery, as well as storing Simon's remains for three days, expecting him to rise again, much like Christ. The encounter is again reinterpreted by the Clementine literature, where, after being bested by Peter, Simon flies away in the night, while Peter follows, and the two of them conduct a cat-and-mouse game across the major cities of the Roman East, while the narrator's family is reunited, healed, and converted to Christianity by Peter. Eventually, Simon is cornered in Antioch, where his lies are shown to the world, and his power revealed to be sourced from demons. And the people of Antioch turn on him before Peter intervenes and saves him from being stoned to death. 
In this account, Simon is said to have been able to turn into smoke, attempted to take the place of Jesus Christ, as well as summoning the soul of a murdered young boy as his familiar, giving him a body of air, and keeping him in his bedroom. These three alternative accounts all emerged long after the events in question were meant to have occurred, and while they are useful as propaganda for the early Christian faith, they are unlikely to be accurate recollections, and should certainly not be seen as such. They are, however, useful to us in showing how Simon the Magus is represented both in the Bible as well as how the Bible was reinterpreted, and therefore how someone with Simon's abilities would be seen by the early church. They were charlatans and heretics, using the powers granted to them by demons to attempt to usurp Christ's position and sway others to their cause, and death was a just punishment. Professor Flint argued that in addition to denigrating the acts of magicians, these texts were also useful in highlighting the authority of the first pope, Peter, and makes the case that these texts were also used to support papal primacy over the other patriarchs, as Simon was able to use his powers with impunity until the Apostles arrive, whereafter they cease to work. Constantius II, son of Constantine the Great, was the second emperor of the Constantinian dynasty that had sole rule over the empire. As his brothers Constantine and Constans, who won no prizes in the original name game, had been killed shortly after taking up their positions in the West. Many of Constantius's other male relatives had also been killed in a massacre either ordered or sanctioned by the new emperor shortly after Constantine's death in 337. Constantius ruled in one form or another for 37 years, an incredible feat by itself, as well as managing to defeat the killer of his brother, Magnentius, reuniting the two halves of the empire and sniffing out a potential rebel in the form of his cousin. In terms of our interest, the contemporary historian Aminianus Marcellinus makes reference to a law code propagated by Constantius that called for the execution of anyone that wore magical amulets or was believed to have stolen from graves for the use in heinous rituals. Ammianus also makes mention of the rebellious cousin of Constantius, Constantius Gallus, who the emperor had made Caesar in the east while he dealt with Magnentius in the west. During his rule, Gallus became known as corrupt and tyrannical, which is held as one of the reasons Constantius had his cousin executed some time later. In his history, Ammianus refers to Gallus having wealthy citizens arrested, charged with witchcraft, and then executed to seize their property. He also says that Gallus would walk the streets of Antioch anonymously to find out people's opinion of them to influence who he targeted, but that is quite a common trope, so we're not quite sure how true these claims are. But, as we've seen before, it is not unheard of for officials to use false charges of witchcraft for material gain. Three years after the death of Constantius in 361, the East was ruled by Flavius Julius Valens Augustus, known to us as Valens, and a particularly paranoid and reactionary emperor he was. According to Socrates Scholasticus in his Ecclesiastical History, a group of meddlesome people performed a necromantic rite in order to discover who would be emperor after Valens. It continues, and I quote, They pursued their magical sorcery, and the demon gave them a reply which was far from clear but obscure, as usual. It indicated the name of the emperor to succeed Valens began with T-H-E-O-D. Now, how did the Emperor react when he heard this news? As Scholasticus puts it, he abandoned the Christian precepts he aspired to adhere to, and began to slaughter many he suspected to be Emperor. Accordingly, those killed were Theodoruses, Theodotuses, Theodosiuses, Theodulises. Now, You've no idea how many times I had to go through that to get those right. Now, while this is a great story, and Valens is known from other sources to have been more paranoid than most emperors, it is unlikely to be true. For starters, the prophecy Scholasticus refers to is correct. The successor of Valens was his relative, Theodosius I. Throughout history, whenever a prophecy appears to have come true, it tends to be the case that the prophecy only emerges after the fact, which makes its value as a prophecy somewhat tarnished. 
Whether Scholasticus invented the story, or was only recording what he had heard himself, his reason for depicting Valens as a paranoid tyrant willing to slaughter his subjects based only on the whispers of a demonic prophecy is unknown. One theory is that, as Scholasticus was a Nicene churchman, his ecclesiastical history sought to denigrate the actions of the Arian emperor, as Arian Christianity, while being denounced as a heresy, was still a powerful force during the time Scholasticus was writing. This conflation of heresy and sorcery would re-emerge under the sibling emperors Honorius and Arcadius, where a law from their reign deals with two heretical sects of Christianity, Eunomians and Montanists. The law decrees that any followers of these sects, quote, are to be expelled from the cities, and if they reside in the country and should hold assemblies, they are to be deported and the owners of the lands they inhabited punished. Heretical books are to be destroyed. Those who refuse to surrender such books are to suffer capital punishment on the charge of sorcery, end quote. The son of Arcadius, who became Theodosius II, oversaw the construction of the Theodosian walls of Constantinople. That would keep the mother of cities more or less impregnable for over a thousand years, not counting that terrible palaver of the Fourth Crusade, of course. He also began a project to collect all legal edicts since the reign of Constantine the Great, which were collected into the Codex Theodosianus. In this code, Theodosius reaffirms the law of his father and uncle, demanding that, and again I quote, all astrologers are to be expelled and exiled unless they burn their books in the presence of a bishop and convert to Christianity, end quote. As we will look at in our episode on the Franks, astrologers were considered linked to sorcerers, but somewhat more respectable in their profession. The Theodosian Code would remain influential through its inclusion in later Roman law codes, such as the Codex Justinianus. Emperor Justinian I ruled the empire for 38 years, between 527 and 565, and during his reign the Roman Empire reconquered the Vandal Kingdom of Africa and the Ostrogothic Kingdom in Italy, as well as expanding into previously uncontrolled regions around the Black Sea. He oversaw the construction of the Hagia Sophia, one of the largest and most spectacular churches in the world, as well as reorganising the volumes of Roman law that had been enacted, abolished, or had become redundant over the thousand years of Republic and Empire. For all of these accomplishments, Justinian gained the epithet the Great, and while there are those that point out the flaws with his accomplishments, that he overextended the empire in a fanciful and impossible dream of recovering the West, or that he rushed the construction of the Hagia Sophia, which led to serious structural problems, the Code of Justinian, the Codex Justinianus, is what interests us today. The Code, written by a commission of ten men, made use of previous law codes such as the Theodosian Code, assembled by Theodosius II of wall fame, as well as unofficial compilations such as the Codex Gregorianus and the Codex Hermogenianus, the laws dated back to the pagan days of the Republic, and so special consideration was made on which laws to keep and which to remove. This was a new legal code for a Christian empire, and so the commission had to ensure that the crimes and their associated punishments had a Christian flavour. Of particular note for this podcast is that the Roman codes discussed in episode 19 were also considered relevant in the Roman East. In the Digest, a section of the code, the Lex Cornelia de Sicarius a Beneficis, the law instituted by the Roman statesman Lucius Cornelius Sulla that we discussed in episode 19, is referred to in a commentary specifically in regards to the punishment of sorcerers and poisoners. Again, the crimes of sorcery and poison are inseparably linked to each other, especially in regards to this law, which deals with abortion and aphrodisiacs. The Lex Cornelia is not copied in its entirety to the new code, specifically in regards to the punishment. The author of the passage points out that the punishment in the Republican Code was confiscation of property and exile to a mine or an island, depending on the class of the criminal. He then points out that Today, people are usually given capital punishment, unless they belong to too high a class to be subject to the punishment prescribed by law. While the Empire may have taken on a newly Christian flavour, the culture of the Roman Empire could not be changed quite as simply as the law. 
This meant the continuation of both the staple of Roman entertainment, the chariot race, as well as the general Roman population's use of defixiones, the curse tablets we saw in episode 19. These two aspects of Roman life were often connected. Defixiones have been found from the 4th century, supposedly made by either the owners, members, or fans of different teams of chariot racers. The most famous of the teams in the late Roman chariot scene were the Blues and the Greens, and the power they often wielded was significant. Chariot racers were such spectacles in Constantinople, and their fans often so rabid, that riots regularly broke out between the fans of each team. Charioteers, as well as those wearing the colours of a team, were, at times, murdered in the streets by their opponents, with some notable violence escalating to such a degree that imperial troops had to restore order with overwhelming force. The emperors were not immune to the excitement of the races, with many openly supporting one team or the other, protecting them from the law, and using state funds and officials to harass and intimidate their opponents. It is therefore no surprise that each side would make use of supernatural attacks in addition to their more physical options. One Defixiones asks for a demon to torture and kill the enemy charioteer's horses, as well as to crush and kill the charioteer himself. Another asks for the other competitor to be torn apart. Our friend Ammianus Marcellinus, the soldier turned historian, refers to charioteers in the same context as beneficium, or magic, at least three times. Once referring to charioteers in general, but twice with specific examples. In one, a certain Orcanius is involved in beneficia, along with four men of senatorial rank, while another describes a man being convicted of apprenticing his son to a magician. There are also occasions when charioteers would take pride in being accused of maleficium by their opponents, if they were too successful in the races and their victories were too common to be dismissed as simply down to the quality of the horses or things like luck, then accusations of magical cheating were often levelled. Effectively, this was the greatest of compliments, but it came with the carried risk of death. In an edict found in the Theodosian Code, charioteers are singled out as often causing the escape of suspected practitioners of magic, with the edict suggesting this was to avoid them revealing their patron during interrogation. However, the same text states that charioteers enacted their own style of justice on those accused, heading lynch mobs to carry out extrajudicial killings. This could be an attempt to tie up loose ends if the magician was on the payroll of the blues or greens. In his article, Charioteers and Magic in 4th Century Rome, Professor Parcia Lee Steakham suggests that these vigilantes could just as easily have taken advantage of a trumped-up charge to deal with their opponents personally, rather than have the charges dismissed in a Roman court. This is certainly a convincing point, as the streets of Rome and Constantinople were violent and bloody, and charioteers and their fans have gone down in history with a stereotype of thuggery. It also matches earlier and later cases of witchcraft accusations, where rivals and enemies accuse each other of the crime with the intention that it would lead to their imprisonment, banishment, or death. The professor then brings up an example given by Ammianus of the blackmail rings that charioteers were often involved in. If a creditor was being too forceful in demanding the payment of a debt, charioteers could level charges of maleficium against the creditor, and in some cases, take them captive only dropping the charges and or releasing them when the debt is dismissed. That is where we will leave it this week. Next week we will return to England, although not the England of Matthew Hopkins and the Stuarts. No, we will go to the time of Angles, Saxons, Jutes, Danes and Normans. As always, thank you to my patrons, the Hammer of the Witches executed today, Witchfinder General Michelle G. My Inquisitors Elaine D, Trish G, and Jean V, and all of my demonologists and theologians. They're all wonderful people, and you can join their ranks by going to patreon.com slash historyofwitchcraft. Besides supporting the podcast, and me financially, please consider leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or Podchaser. You can always drop me an email at witchcraftpodcast at gmail.com, or message me on Twitter or on the Facebook page, at History of Witch and the History of Witchcraft podcast, respectively. The intro and outro music have been provided by Sounds Like an Earful. 
Thank you again for listening. <laughs>